Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me in podcast number 19 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to focus on the colonial judiciary and on county government in the colonies. I've combined these two topics because back then, county government was an extension of the county courts. In the last couple of podcasts in my series, I focused on how the colonies were governed. This is a good foundation material for a future podcast I plan to do on the United States Constitution. I've emphasized that the colonial governments tended to mirror the structure of what existed in England. While this is true, I should also emphasize that each of the 13 colonies had their own unique differences. For example, in my last podcast about the colonial legislatures, I said that the council, which served as the upper house in each colonial legislature, consisted of 12 members. It would have been more accurate to say that it usually consisted of 12 members. So while England served as the model, the colonies did not exactly replicate England's government structure in every detail. This was especially true where colonial courts were concerned. Colonial society was simpler, especially regarding commercial activity, and required a certain flexibility to cope with frontier conditions. History isn't always the most interesting thing to listen to, especially when you put the word legal in front of it. But English legal and constitutional concepts bled heavily over into colonial culture and lodged themselves into the first state constitutions and later into the U.S. Constitution, where they remain today still exerting an influence on American society. In order to understand the colonial judiciary, and indeed the modern American judiciary, we have to go back centuries into English law. Centuries ago, the king was originally the highest judge in the land, and kings actually held court. But as time passed and they became busy, this function, or judicial function, of presiding over courts and holding trials, was led off to other people, such as counselors or committees or other members of the king's council. By the time of the 1600s, when the colonies were being founded, the kings played very little role, direct role anyway, in the judicial process. They certainly weren't sitting and presiding at sessions of any courts. Still, the king had the power to appoint and fire judges at their own will. In fact, all judges served at the king's pleasure, and it should come as no surprise that courts often acted as tools of the king. They were certainly an extension of his power. It's very important to keep in mind at this time that in these stages of English development, The distinction between the three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, were very blurry. They weren't well defined like they are today in our system. And originally, the king was heavily involved in all three functions or branches of government. In fact, he was the authority behind all three branches of government. At the time of the founding of the colonies in the 1600s, the English judiciary was just emerging as an independent branch of government. Over the centuries, there had emerged a body of laws that judges and sometimes the legal community in general attempted to use to try and limit the king's power. This often didn't go well for them, and they didn't do it very often. But in these early stages, you can see what we would call today in modern American law the concept of judicial review. This starts out as a conflict between the judiciary and the king, where the judiciary is saying the king can't do certain things because it violates the law. In modern American law, it usually takes the form of a court saying that something is unconstitutional, so the government therefore can't do it. After the upheavals in 1600s England, Parliament emerged as the dominant power in England, and they began to limit the king's power to manipulate and control the courts. In 1701, Parliament passed an act that limited the king's power to appoint judges and to remove them. Judges would no longer serve at the king's pleasure, but rather during good behavior, That phrase, good behavior, is an important phrase because it appears in our own U.S. Constitution today. This meant that judges just couldn't be removed on a whim, that there had to be actually some misconduct they had done that would justify their removal from the bench. In London, the central courts consisted of the Court of King's Bench, which handled criminal cases, and the Court of Common Pleas, which handled civil cases, and there was the Court of Exchequer, which handled revenue and taxation issues. These courts administered what is called the common law of England, and this law is pervasive today even among all of England's former colonies, such as the United States, Canada, Australia, and so forth. Another important court that was not part of the common law court system was the Chancery Court, which was presided over by the Chancellor. The Chancery Court was said to be the conscience of the king. The common law could be rigid and even harsh. The Chancery Court could provide flexible remedies and adapt the law to new fact patterns that the common law was not equipped to deal with. The kind of law dispensed by the chancellery court was called equity or equitable law. 
Lastly, I'd like to mention the Admiralty Courts of England. These courts, as the name implies, handled matters that were maritime in nature or things that happened on the high seas. The reason I've gone through these courts in different areas of law is because they are still influencing us today. In fact, the U.S. Constitution mentions admiralty, equity, and law, and combines them all into one system, which is our federal court system. Interestingly, some states still have some of these old types of English courts. For example, the state of Delaware has both a chancery court and a court of common pleas. But that's rare. Most states have combined all these different types of law and functions into one court system. One last interesting little thing that I'll share has to do with England's highest court, which is the House of Lords. For centuries, the House of Lords, which also serves as the upper chamber for the Parliament, was the highest court in England. As I mentioned earlier, these institutions come out of a time when the distinction between legislative, executive, and judicial branches were not always so well defined. In 2009, a law passed in England changed the judicial functions of the House of Lords and created a Supreme Court similar to what we have in the U.S. In the early years of their existence, there was a great deal of informality in judicial matters in the colonies. There are stories of governors sitting in churches or on porches or even on tree stumps and meadows hearing cases and dispensing justice on the fly. But as the colonies grew and were divided into counties, colonial governors began to establish courts on a more formal basis. Judges and justices of the peace were appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the council. The justices of the peace ran the county court systems, and they had jurisdiction to hear both criminal and civil matters. As we'll see later in this podcast, as we talk about county administration, we'll see that the justices of the peace really were the cornerstones of county administration and government. From reading accounts of county sessions of court, one gets the impression that these were social events sometimes. And it's probably true, especially in the South, where people live spread out from each other. This might be the one chance they have for a while to mingle with their neighbors and to socialize. If parties to a lawsuit were not satisfied with what they'd received at the justice courts, they could appeal their case to the council, which was presided over by the governor, to hear appeals. One of the problems with this situation, though, is that many members of the council were often also justices of the peace, and by the time your case got to the council, it might have already been heard by members of the council in their role as justices of the peace. Later on, the hearing of appeals became the duty of a chief justice who sat with associate justices to hear appeals. One of the difficulties governors had was that there were very few people trained in law in the colonies. Many, if not most, of the people who were appointed to be judges or justices of the peace had no legal training at all, maybe just a bare minimum of experience in handling their own affairs. I don't know if the lack of formal legal training made the quality of justice worse in the colonies than it was in England, but there were lots of petitions to the king complaining of unfairness, abuse of power, and irregularity in the colonial court proceedings. The king must have taken these complaints seriously because he did require the governors as early as the 1680s to start submitting reports to the government about the courts and their proceedings. Governors were also encouraged to recruit or hire chief justices who had formal legal training in England to come to the colonies to help supervise the work of the courts. In the early 1700s, the king issued these instructions to the governors of his colonies. He wrote, And whereas frequent complaints have been made of great delays and undue proceedings in the courts of justice of several of our plantations, whereby many of our good subjects have very much suffered, we do particularly require you to take a special care that in all courts where you are authorized to preside, justice be impartially administered, and that in all other courts established within our said province, all judges and other persons therein concerned do likewise perform their several duties without delay or partiality. Certain kinds of cases could be appealed from the colonial courts to England, but the king directed that these appeals go to his personal council, or what was called the Privy Council. This, in effect, put the colonists outside of the normal judicial system of England, since their appeals were being heard by a council composed of the king's councillors. Between 1696 and the time of the American Revolution, there were almost 800 appeals from the colonies to the Privy Council. Appealing to the Privy Council would have been a very time-consuming and expensive proposition because it would have meant traveling to England. In the early days of the colonies, the assemblies insisted that they had the right to hear cases as a final court or as a supreme court in each colony. The king put a stop to this by issuing instructions to his governors forbidding the assemblies to hear any cases or to act as in a court of appeals. One of the most contentious issues surrounding judges had to do with their tenure. 
How long should they hold office, and for what causes could they be removed? Technically, the colonial assemblies didn't have power to impeach. The king insisted that his governors had the right to appoint judges during pleasure, meaning that they could keep a judge in office as long as they pleased to and could remove him for pretty much any cause they wished. Theoretically, this gave the king and his governors complete control over the judges and the judiciary. Colonial assemblies deeply resented this, and as with everything in the colony, they felt since the public money was paying for the judges and their salaries, that they ought to have a say in how judges were appointed and removed. The assemblies insisted that the judges should be appointed during good behavior, meaning that they couldn't be removed unless they actually had done something wrong. The king issued these instructions to his governor, saying, Whereas laws have been lately passed or attempted to be passed in several of our colonies in America, enacting that the judges of the several courts of judicature or other chief officers of justice in the said colonies shall hold their offices during good behavior, you are to take particular care in all commissions to be by you granted to the said chief judges or other justices of the courts of judicature that the said commissions are granted during pleasure only, agreeable to what has been the ancient practice and usage in our said colonies and plantations. On paper, the king won this battle with these instructions. However, the assemblies in the colonies had a few tricks up their own sleeves. They were used to dealing with governors who were often autocratic as the king was. They simply refused to grant judges salaries for more than a year at a time, and they could also trim a judge's salaries whenever they felt like it. They had done this tactic with the governors in the past, and it gave them a measure of control over judges, too, that they didn't like. To get around this, the king started paying the judges' salaries out of funds that the colonial assemblies didn't have control over. And in fact, this became one of the complaints in the Declaration of Independence that the king had made the judges dependent upon his will by paying their salaries and keeping them in office during his pleasure. Even though the English colonists in North America tended to imitate the mother country, they couldn't always do that in every case. For example, in England there were ecclesiastical courts. These courts presided over things such as probate and divorce matters. But there were no ecclesiastical courts in the American colonies and never would be. These probably wouldn't have worked. The tendency was for the colonists to simplify and reduce and combine jurisdictions into the general courts they were familiar with. But oddly enough, sometimes the colonists did imitate England in really strange ways. For example, England had little courts called pie powder courts. These courts had jurisdictions over merchants selling their wares at county fairs, and in the colonies there were actually instances of these courts being set up to do the same thing. I mentioned earlier that there were chancery courts and admiralty courts in England. Generally speaking, these courts were not popular in the colonies. For one reason, neither of them used juries, and English colonists felt that juries were their rights as Englishmen to have. There were also the issues of the fact that the assemblies couldn't control these courts, and generally speaking, the assemblies didn't like anything going on within the colonies that they couldn't control or have a say in. During the build-up to the American Revolution, we'll see that the king used the admiralty courts to get his way on things because the courts, again, didn't use juries, which seldom found in favor of the king at that time, and because they were more reliable for the king's purposes. With so few people possessing formal legal training, we have to ask the question, what did the colonists do for lawyers? As a general rule, there was hostility towards lawyers in the colonies. In fact, there were even riots against them and allegations that they were stirring up problems so they would have employment. Sometimes people just simply hired a neighbor or friend whose only qualification might be that they had their own involvement in a lawsuit and understood some of the procedure. But since the courts were so informal themselves, and since the justices of the peace themselves often had no formal legal training, I'm not sure it mattered all that much. In New York City, there were so few trained lawyers that it was a practice for litigants to hire all the attorneys in the city so that the opposing litigants wouldn't have anyone to hire. In 1698, a man named Lord Bellamont was visiting New York City and he had a very low opinion of the attorneys that he saw there, and he wrote this report back to the Privy Council about what he saw, saying, As to the men that call themselves lawyers here and practice at the bar, they are almost all under such a scandalous character that it would grieve a man to see our noble English laws so miserably mangled and profaned. I do not find that a man of them ever arrived at being an attorney in England, so far from being barristers, one of them was a dancing master, another a glover by trade, a third, which is Mr. Jameson, was condemned to be hanged in Scotland for burning the Bible and for blasphemy, 
A fourth, which is Mr. Nichols, your lordships have had his character formerly from me, and there are two or three more as bad as the rest. Besides their ignorance in the law, they are all except one or two violent enemies to the government, and they do a world of mischief in the country by infecting the people with ill principles towards the government. With so much complaining about the lawyers, it's interesting that the kings very seldom, almost never, issued any kind of instructions about regulating lawyers. They pretty much left that matter up to the governors of each colony to deal with. Some of the governors did make legitimate efforts to try and control things and improve the quality of legal services within their colony. One of these governors was Governor Seymour of Maryland. Seymour complained that within his colony, lawyers were stirring up vexatious and litigious suits, multiplying them to the private lucre and gain by senseless and insignificant brawls, repetitions, impertinent cavils, the time of the courts is consumed and taken up for the most part in trifles. Governor Seymour set up Maryland's first bar to try and regulate the people who would be admitted to practicing law within the colony. One of the most notorious persons practicing law was a man named Thomas McNamara. He was denied admission to the bar even though he had been active in representing people in lawsuits, and in fact he had been ordered by the governor to represent some indigent people free of charge, whereupon he instead had the people that he was representing pay him 20 shillings and 100 pounds of bacon as payment. When the governor found out that he had actually extorted this money out of these people that were supposed to be his clients that he was supposed to be doing this work for, the governor called them in at a hearing, and at the hearing, McNamara became angry that he was being asked to give back the payment that he'd received when he was ordered to do it for free. And the record says, Upon this saucy answer and other audacious behavior, His Excellency ordered the sheriff to put him, McNamara, in the stocks one full hour, bare breached, of which His Excellency was pleased to remit half an hour, a great gust arising. So you can picture this lawyer out there with no pants on, sitting out in the stocks in the cold, windy weather. As the colonies matured, certainly the quality of legal talent matured as well in the colonies. We have such famous persons as John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson, all of whom were lawyers in their times. County government back in colonial times is different in many important respects than it is today. In modern times, counties are run by elected boards or commissioners, and all the different functions from tax collection to assessing property to the sheriff, all of those offices are normally elected by the, the voters in each county. That wasn't the case back in colonial times. The functions we normally associate with elected county officials in our modern world were handled by the justices of the peace back then. The justices of the peace were responsible for making sure that roads were laid out and surveyed, that repairs were done on roads and bridges, licensing of taverns, and all the different things we associate with county government doing. They even issued regulations that amounted to what our modern ordinances would look like. For example, in 1697, the justices of the peace in one county decreed that no person whatsoever, either wittingly or willingly, was to presume to piss against any of the walls, posts, or rails within the outside rails of the state house. And that ordinance certainly conjures up colorful details. It is truly said that the justices of the peace were the foundation stones of colonial government, and that's very true. Another important county official that I want to briefly discuss was the sheriff. The office of sheriff goes way back into ancient Anglo-Saxon England. In fact, the word sheriff is made up of two Anglo-Saxon words, shire reeve. Back in ancient times, England was divided into shires by the Anglo-Saxons, and the shires were later called counties as they are today. In medieval times, the sheriff was the most important county official in England. They were a connection between the central government of the king and the local county governments. Their duties included everything from not only law enforcement, but to commanding the militia, calling of the county court, and collecting taxes. Counties in medieval England, as they were in the colonies, were subdivided into units called hundreds, and the sheriffs were also responsible for overseeing the functions of these units as well. In late medieval times, the sheriff was replaced as the most important county official by the justice of the peace. This was certainly true by colonial times. In the colonies, the sheriff was usually responsible for law enforcement, apprehending criminals, carrying out the orders of the court, and for county elections as well. In modern American settings, the sheriff is usually responsible for simply law enforcement and maintaining the county jail. I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. To keep it short and brief, because I know that history lectures can become very boring very quickly, I've had to cut out a lot of interesting material. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. A History of American Law by Lawrence M. Friedman.
Origins of the Common Law by Arthur Hogue. A Constitutional and Legal History of England by Bryce Lyon. The Lion and the Throne, The Life and Times of Sir Edward Cook by Catherine Drinker Bowen. The Courts and the American Colonies by Erwin C. Surrency, published in the American Journal of Legal History, Part 1 in Volume 11, Number 3, July 1967, and Part 2 in Volume 11, Number 4, October 1967. The Development of the Judicial System in Rhode Island by Amasa M. Eaton, published in the Yale Law Journal, Volume 14, Number 3, January 1905. The Supreme Judicial Power in the Colony of Massachusetts Bay by Mark DeWolf Howe and Lewis F. Eaton, Jr., published in the New England Quarterly, Volume 20, Number 3, September 1947. The Separation of Powers in the 18th Century by William Seal Carpenter, published in the American Political Science Review, Volume 22, Number 1, February 1928. County Government in New England by Frank A. Updike, published in the Annals of the American Academy of Political Science and Social Science, Volume 47, May 1913. And An Independent Judiciary, The Colonial Background by Joseph H. Smith, published in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, Volume 124, 1976.